ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is actually going to be joining us uh, with a talk called New Tools for Your Threat Hunting Toolbox. And it's Mark Maggot. Hey, Mark, how you doing today? Doing very well. Thanks. Um, I, I usually, I'm going to tell everyone here in this very quick introduction, because I'm going to let Mark then take over. He, he, he needs very little introduction inside of SANS. Uh, Long-term SANS instructor, um, awesome, awesome guy, developed some of the coolest tools, and quite frankly, has wrangled Python like no snake charmer I've ever met in my life. But... One of the things that's always caught my interest about Mark, and if any of you have not seen this, I'll throw it in the channel. I encourage you to go check it out. Mark's bio is, quite frankly, one of the most interesting things. I'm just going to read the first sentence to you. Mark Baggett's first foray into information security was on the receiving end of hacking. I'm just going to put that there as what a way to get into the, uh, to get into the industry, if you will, um, with a great intro like that. So, uh, Mark, without really too much delay, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you, ladies and gentlemen, our senior instructor from SANS, Mark Baggett. All yours, sir. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Matt. I really appreciate that. So good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to be here at the SANS Threat Hunting Summit. Um, I want to introduce some tools to you that um, are free open source that you can use to enhance your threat hunting capability. Um, just by way of introduction, um, as Matt said, I'm a senior SANS instructor. I'm the course author for SANS SEC 573. And I've been doing this information security thing for a while. So these, these tools I want to um, present to you today, the first two of them work kind of the same way in that um, they are intended to, well, be assistance, if you will, in your threat hunting um, capabilities, right? So when I'm going through a threat hunting process and I'm looking at um, my, my network defense systems and um, looking at my host uh, logs. I'm, I'm going through Zeek logs. I'm going through my intrusion detection system logs. I'm trying to understand the attacks. There's usually a couple of well, things that I do as my first, um, first attempt to understand what's going on. I want to um, make those things easier for you. I want to give you some tools that's going to assist you with that. I'm doing that. And these first two tools work in the same way. Both of them stand up as an additional web server that you would, you could either run it on um, your, you know, your, your SIM host or just some network that's just going to sit there and listen on a port. And then you can send little um, queries to it and it will do something for you, give you back some piece of data that's going to supplement either an IP address or a host name. Um, and, and then get you started in your threat hunting um, experience. So you could run different commands on different ports, but both of these first two tools work the same way. So the first one I wanna tell you about is a tool called API-ify. Okay? A um, little bit of the history of API-ify. I wrote a tool called Domain Stats and people liked it. It was, uh, got integrated into Security Onion, some other platforms like that that were um, being used by threat hunters in order to figure out what's going on. Now we'll talk a little bit about what domain stats does in a minute, but domain stats had some significant performance issues. Domain stats relied on who is queries, right? So I wanna get some information about a domain that I've seen on my network. So I'll do a who is query. So it would do that for you in the background and keep that information um, for those domains. And it's designed to be integrated into your logs. So every time I see google.com, I don't wanna do a who is lookup over and over and over again. So uh, it would do a who is lookup, cache the information, and then uh, for each additional uh, Google, um, every other time Google showed up in your logs, it would just grab the cached information. Uh, well, a couple of problems that were it ran into is one is, well, who is would rate limit your number of queries. So your the, the who is servers didn't quite like that. Um, if you read it, they say, yeah, don't use who is this way. Um, and the other thing is the cache would just grow to an unlimited size, consume all your memory, and then it would just begin to run so slow. So the longer you ran, the bigger your cache got, and then, well, it just became unusable. When you restarted it, the cache was gone, and then you had to start all the way back over. So it had some issues. Well, as I talk to people, it seems like the only thing that people really use domain stats for was the domain creation date, right? Why would be, they be interested in that domain creation date? Well, as it turns out, legitimate domains like Google, YouTube, Reddit, Slack, these have all been around for a really long time. When a new company buys a domain, it'll take them two, three years before they build a credible product around there that people want to use, that um, they can get their marketing in place, that people will begin to use the site. And so by, before somebody, you see these things in your domains, it's usually a couple of years before we have legitimate domains showing up in our domain, uh, in our, our DNS logs. But you know, command and control, phishing domains, 
typically attackers are going to buy those and then begin using them right away. So this creation date of the domains is useful pieces of information. And that's really the only thing that people use domain stats for. So domain stats 1.0, it, it queried things on the back end and it cached this stuff. And you could, you could set up a website and then you could send off these queries and it would work. Okay. But again, the only thing that people were using it for were these creation dates of the domain. So I rewrote it, focusing on those domain stat, uh, those the creation dates. And two point, domain stats 2.0, I've published that on my website, uh, on my GitHub page. And the reaction from the community was overwhelming. Thank you. It was, oh, boo, can we get the old tool back, right? Oh, I want my old domain stats because, um, well, I've, I'm, I'm used to how that works. So um, in response to that, Right? It, it had so many performance issues. I just didn't want to continue to support it because it was broke. So I released a tool called APIFI. Okay? And what APIFI is, is it's intended to let you run any command, not just who is, but whatever commands that you want to do as your first look into looking into IP addresses, host names, whatever, right? I'm going to give you a, a web page that has a cache that will um, store those responses so that you can continuously query it over and over again with your log systems. And it'll just pull that information back from the cache. So the cache is now stable. You can have limits around the, um, how fast or how big it grows, when things expire, and you can run any command line tool that you want to. So just to get an idea of how we could use API-FI, let's look at a first use case and reproduce the thing that we could would have done inside of domain stats, which was who is queries. So here I have an LS of API-FI, and you can see that there's a, a bunch of files in there. The one I'm really interested in here is the YAML file. So if I look at this YAML file um, here, I can see that at the top, I've got lots of different settings that I can use to control the cache, right? I've got a number of cached entries. Um, I've got uh, how long things live in the cache. If you have a negative one here, that means that, well, it's going to stay in the cache until it expires. Now, the number of items in the cache are kept on in there based upon the most recently used is kept, but the least recently used is the ones that expire out. So if I've got a domain I only queried once, that's gonna be what leaves the cache as opposed to the thing google.com, which is queried over and over again, is gonna stay in that cache um, for whatever period of time or um, that we've got to find here. Um, some other settings that we've got in here that I, I won't go through all of these, uh, one thing I'll point out is it does have debug statements, which are turned on by default, and you want to turn those off when you use this in production. But down here, you can see this base command that I've got set up for this example of who, who it, or API FI is to run who is, and then this asterisk net info. That argument right there is going to be whatever it is that I put on the URL when I run API FI. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and um, come over here and let's run API FI with this configuration. And it, it asked me if I want to load the cache from the previous one. I'll just say no. It tells me, all right, this is the command I'm going to run. Who is plus whatever's on the website. So I can go to the web server it's where it's listening. Oops, slash, slash, 127, 001. And I'll go to google.com. Okay. And it goes out and it does a who is query. And I get back who is um, for google.com. Okay. So this will make get running additional commands and this is going to be cached and given back. But you know what? I really don't want all this. I just want that creation date. Well, inside of the YAML file, you can also associate a regular expression with the different uh, commands. So here, the output of this who is file is going to be run through this regular expression. You can define whatever regular expressions you want to um, capture whatever data you want. I'm going to stop API if I rerun it again. No, I'm not going to load the cache. Come back over here. Now when I ask for Google, right now, I'm just going to get back. Run API FI. Did I save my um, file here? Let's save this file. Let's come over. Let's come over here to API FI. Let's stop this. Let's start it back up. Don't load the cache. And then let's make another request to google.com. Okay, the regular expression runs and it pulls back just that data. Okay, so that's, that's an example of how I could reproduce the content that was inside of domain stats. So it's a very simple YAML. You're just going to put the command you want to run right inside of this thing and you're going to get back a nice JSON response that you can consume into um, whatever your platform is. 
All right, so let's, let's look at what another case um, study might be. Let's, uh, let's say that I want to run trace routes, right? So every Zeek, um, everything that falls into a particular uh, uh, type of an event in Zeek, or uh, I want to do a trace route on that host, right? Uh, so I have two hosts on there. If they share the same infrastructure, right, then they might be in the same spot. So I want to know which hops each of these um, different connections to my network go through. But there's a problem with this idea, and that is, well, if I try to do a trace route to google.com here, you can see that my trace route to google.com takes a minute and six seconds. So if I'm going to run this at the speed of log and run a trace route query, that's just, that's just not going to work, right? So there are some things I can do to make trace route faster. Um, trace route, you can do a dash N, which says don't resolve host names, which is going to make that go much, much faster. You can use the dash F option and then give it a number and it'll, it'll skip that number of initial hops, right? I, I know what my infrastructure looks like. I know what my firewall looks like. I know what my internet service providers um, infrastructure look like. I'm interested in what's beyond that because that's what's unique to these attackers that are coming into my IP address. So I'll skip the first couple of um, requests. Also tracer out by default, it, traces each of those um, links three times. So I'm gonna just change that to just trace once. And I'm also gonna do this over TCP port 80. Um, so TCP port 80, don't resolve host, just um, query it once and skip the first three hops. Now my trace route to google.com is, well, sub one second. All right, so now this is perhaps something I can work with. So let's put this into API-ify. So I'll come over here to my API-ify.yaml I'm gonna comment out these two, and you can see that I've got lots of different um, API-ify commands in here that are already written for you. Here's my trace route commands. I'm just gonna highlight these and uncomment them, and then I'm going to save it. And so now I'm gonna come back over here. I'm gonna run API-ify again, and we'll stop this thing. And you'll notice all these debug messages. These are going to significantly slow down your, uh, your programs you do not want debugs um, turned on when you got this thing in production, okay? Um, so here I'm gonna, now it's, it's set up, my command is gonna run that trace route. So we can come back over here and we can ask it, well, let's just go back to google.com, okay? And it does my trace route in the background to google.com. Oh, is this, this is cached, sorry. Did I save it? What's going on here? No, well, that is the right thing. Let's come over here and try this. HTTP colon slash slash 127.001 port 8000 uh, microsoft.com. Okay, it's going off. It's doing my who is, or it's doing my trace route in the background. And you can see 24 hops. That wasn't too bad for 24 hops. Now the beauty of that is that now that's cached. So my next Microsoft query is going to be, well, returned instantaneously. Um, so every time I see that in my log again, I'm not running that query over and over again. Okay, so well, how effective could this possibly be? Um, oh, some other options that you've got in domain stats. So you do have um, a um, cache entry so that you can show what's in your cache. Um, you've got some tools that we can sort this based upon um, the number of hits to times that were in the cache um, and information such as that um, that are available. So one of the things I can do if I wanted to use some tools that are gonna analyze the cache is I could run a save. And then I could use this tool called dump cache that will allow me to sort the information in the cache. So even if you don't have a seam, right? If you, if you don't have um, soft elk that's there doing all of your an analysis for you, then you could still um, just in your home network where you've got a very simple network, use this tool and get some good information back uh, from it. So how effective would this be? So what I did is I went and I grabbed the SANS Internet Storm Center's block list. Let's just take SANS Internet Center um, block list and just do I'm going to run my API FI that's going to do the trace route, and I'm going to do a wget and just um, uh, to each of uh, to my API FI and pass each of the IP addresses that were in the um, Internet Storm Center's block list to API FI. It does the trace route in the background, and then I can use dump cache in order to analyze this stuff and just sort it based upon the data. What you see here is a couple of different trace routes here. So here you can see each and every one of these IP addresses, the infrastructure is exactly the same, right? Look at the number of hops, the IP addresses. These all share the exact same infrastructure between them and me. But look at the IP ranges. I 
would venture to guess that if you just saw these IP addresses without this contextual information that says that, hey, these have the exact same infrastructure, that you would not guess that this IP address has any relation to this IP address and this IP address. I mean, these are completely different subnets or completely different networks, right? But they share the same infrastructure. And so that's useful information when I'm threat hunting on my network. Okay, so that's, that's API-FI. It comes with, in the, um, the YAML, you get uh, several examples that I've got there, but it's really whatever the first commands that you yourself do to investigate these um, different tools, you can put whatever you want to in there and just replace the IP address or the, the host name or whatever it is with that web info thing. But I've got examples in there for pings, for who is lookups, for just the creation date from the who is, for trace routes with just getting the last hop or trace routes getting the first hop. Um, some geolocation using web APIs. So it'll go out to um, different websites and it'll look up the physical location. Also, you can submit to SANS Internet Storms. There's a configuration in there to submit to the SANS Internet Storm Center's API, but really anything that you want to do, you can um, have it do this. And that's going to do the, the, the focus is on the caching and running this thing at the speed of log. Okay. All right. So I mentioned that that API file was just a response to the fact that I broke um, domain stats. Well, what was it that I was so excited about domain stats to do? Well, domain stats, remember, we're looking for those new domains that are on the network. So domain stat two has been a complete rewrite um, and it's focused on making that creation date as useful to us as possible. And it's actually gonna take the domains and it's gonna categorize three, um, it's gonna break the domains down into um, a couple of different pieces of information. You're gonna get back seen by web, seen by you and seen by ISC or SANS Internet Storm Center. Um, now, the seen by web date is going to be that traditional born on date. This is the first time that the internet saw this domain. It's when the domain was born. Now, rather than getting this from who is, right, which had um, problems running at scale, I've, I've used a couple of other solutions in order to get this information. One is, this thing has a database, right? It's gonna, I'm uh, gonna be populated with say the top 1 million most commonly used domains. For, so for domains that have been around for a while and are very commonly used, you're not gonna make any web requests at all. You're not gonna do any who is requests. You're just gonna grab it from the database. Um, and I've taken into consideration when things expire. So if you have something in the database and it expires, well then it'll do the who is lookup and update the database. And right? so you're gonna, you've got a backend database that's gonna minimize the number of requests that you've got. Um, and when you do have to go to uh, the web in order to look up what things are, I've got a couple of other things that I want to do. Rather than you doing a who is look up yourself, um, I want you to, well, do a who is look up to a domain stats server that's running for the Stans Internet Storm Center. And then they will then do the look up for you um, and give you back the response. So what that means is I can give you an additional piece of information. I, seen by Internet Storm Center is now going to be right, the first contact for everybody who's running domain stats. So when you query a domain, you'll see that, okay, this domain has been around for 10 years, okay, um, but you're the first person who's ever queried it who's running domain stats. That might be interesting. Or here's a domain that's brand new to, to the internet, right, it was just registered in the last um, 30 days, um, and oh, by the way, you're the only person who's using domain stats who's ever seen this domain, Okay, so we've got some community intelligence that's going on there. You also got this seen by you record, which is the first time you've ever queried this domain. So this is, you can think of this as the zone of alarm of DNS names on your network, right? You, no one in your organization has ever queried this particular domain before. That is useful information, right? And then um, there's alerts tied into each of these things. So uh, there's a, a first seen by you first, seen by Internet Storm Center. Um, these are going to generate alerts. And SANS Internet Storm Center, if they've tracked a domain and they know that it's um, bad, then the intention is that they'll be able to send additional alerts. Now, there's some there's some caveats um, on the SANS Internet Storm Center. Due to some COVID things, we, we got some delays that are there, and I'll talk about that in just a second. It comes with Zeek deployment scripts. So it's already got the Zeek script. Thank you, Don Williams. It's um, already integrated into the platform that you can just um, tie this into your Zeek scripts and it will automatically make the queries to domain stats um, and look up these domains and provide this information um, back to you. 
Uh, it's got a container, Docker container deployment. So you can just install this thing in just a couple of minutes if you've got um, Dockers running on your system and then it'll expose that service on your computer. Um, but the focus is really on making this thing run at the speed of log. I want it to be able to um, give you back this information um, and minimize disk IO, keep all of the things local to your network and not have to do those who is information uh, lookups. Right, it's very easy to deploy with Security Onion or anything that you've got a Docker. You can just use these instructions, Docker build, give it a tag name, um, have it build directly from the GitHub page. You do have to give it a directory outside the container where the database and all of the logging information and the YAML configuration file and things are going to be kept. And then you can Docker run, run this thing. Now, I would say the first time you run it, you want to run it visibly in the background with the dash IT um, option so that you can see it building the database, right? Because as I said, I want to have a database that has as many records as I can down there on your system so that you don't have to go out to the web. This takes about 15, 20 minutes, depending upon um, the size of your system to, to build that database. And so that you don't get impatient and kill your um, containers, run it visibly in the foreground so you can see it the first time. But once you've done that, well, then you can just run it invisibly and then Docker stop, Docker start, and um, it will keep all of the information inside of this mounted directory that you've provided it and uh, outside of the, the container for permanent um, storage. Okay. All right. So let's do a quick demo on domain stats. So I'm going to come back over here and let's stop API fi because I'm using the same port. And I'm going to run my domain stats and just point it at this directory where I've already got some DS data. So that contains my database and other information. So now let's come back over here and let's just ask for a domain such as google.com. So if I go to google.com here, I can see um, I very quickly get back the scene by um, web. This is when the domain was created. Seen by you, it says local, meaning that I didn't have to query anybody. This came from the local database, right? So um, I queried the information, got it on my database. Seen by you, this is the very first time that um, I looked up the google.com domain um, using this instance of domain stats. Now you can close, as you see, I just started this. So it maintains this information through a cache and through a database. So it, it doesn't um, matter that I stopped and started the service. Here you can see that the category is established. So here, this is telling me Google's been around for a while. You're probably not that worried about Google. Okay, um, but let's let's take a look at um, a couple of other domains here and see what those look like. So um, first, well, let's try Reddit.com first. Okay, Reddit. All right, so Reddit.com. I go there. I get the born on date for that. Uh, I can see that this is the very first time that I've done it. So I get this additional alert, first contact. This is my first contact ever to Reddit. So I know nobody in my domain, nobody on my network has ever gone to Reddit before. And now they have, you can see that I do it again. And that first contact alert goes away, indicating that it's not there. Okay, let's try uh, some uh, domain that's brand new. So I actually just looked up, this one was just um, registered today, then COVID hit. Dot com. All right, so if I go out to then um, COVID hit.com, you can see that this one is my first contact. And also the category here is new, right? This is a new domain. Um, first time it was seen on the web was yesterday. So um, I get that new alert. So I can very quickly go in and to my seam, I can um, categorize by new, I can categorize by the alerts, and I can find these new domains that are on the network. Um, and then I can begin my hunt teaming from there. So that's the um, idea behind, um, uh, behind domain sets. Now here you can see for this one, seen by ISC is RDAP. Okay, so um, at the moment, the SANS Internet Storm Center is not up and running. So um, uh, we, were, we had planned to release this perhaps at um, SANS Fire this year, but then, but then COVID hit.com, right? Um, which by the way, there's lots and lots of COVID related domains being registered. Many of them I'm sure have uh, not the best of intentions um, for users. I think there's 2000 COVID related domains being um, registered a day at the moment. So I don't know what that website is going to be um, once, once it's stood up. So I'll just throw that out there as a word of caution. All right, so sorry, uh, RDAP. 
it, SANS Internet Storm Center isn't, um, they don't have their domain stats server, right? And I, um, I'm waiting to see what the status of that thing is going to be. But in the meantime, um, until that SANS Internet Storm Center is stood up, you can still use domain stats today, right? But instead of going to um, in SANS Internet Storm Center for the lookup, it's going to do an RDAP query to look that information up. So RDAP is a new protocol that we can use to, it, it's much more structured information than who is records, right? Who is, it could be called creation date. It could be called, um, it could be called, uh, um, I don't know, born on. There's just so many different names. When, I, when, when Gregory Bell was talking about the need for standardized information, I was, yes, yes, you are correct. We need these things to be called the same way. Well, RDAP is one in, um, intention to try and solve that for those who is records. So the, it'll use the RDAP protocol to look up those domains. Now today, RDAP support is limited to um, a cert, uh, the most, com, uh, the, most the, the top uh, TLDs, like com, edu, um, the ETLDs, like the, the country specific ones, it doesn't have support for that yet, but those, those are coming in the future. So RDAP um, is the mode you'll use until SANS Internet Storm Center becomes available. Okay. All right, so that's domain stats. It's a new tool, um, it's out there today. I'd encourage you to go give it a try. Um, tools three and four that I wanna talk about are all related to that system resource utilization management database, right? So if you go into your task manager, um, you look at your app history tab on your task manager, you'll see resources um, usage since, and then it's 30 days back. So for the last month, um, task manager is keeping this application history. And if you look at it in the GUI, you don't see a lot of great information there, right? It's these Metro apps that, um, well, there's just not, there's just not a whole lot of value when I look at that, but the database itself keeps a lot of great information in it, right? It, it maintains a list of all the processes that have run, the amount of CPU time they've taken, the amount of network traffic they've consumed, the users that ran that tool. It's full of great information for hunting on the endpoints. So, a couple of tools that have um, been released that you can use to get access to this information. Scrum Dump, you may have heard of. It's got, it's got a, the focus there is on ease of use, right? I want for uh, investigators to be able to just run it, point it at a Scrum, and then give you a nice graphical user interface that's going to then build Excel spreadsheets that have multiple tabs with each of the different um, fields that are in the database. It does lookups for you to, um, to translate information that's yeah, just a GUID in the database to the actual usernames, just um, a profile ID to the actual wireless network names, things like that um, are all done for you in Scrum Dump. So it's focused on ease of use and analyzing one host. But what I found is what I, I wanted to use Scrum Dump on well, everything in the network, right? You go into an incident and there's no logs, right? You, you've, you've got no logs of what's going on in your endpoints. So I wanted to be able to ask the question, well, I want the list of every process that's run on every host in the domain over the last 30 days. I wanna run Scrum Dump, but on every endpoint in the system and bring that back to a centralized um, location where I can then analyze the processes, see who's run what, uh, what times, and things like that. So ESE to CSV was my answer to that, right? So it's, a command line version of ES um, of Scrum Dump that is focused on well, making that mass collection and analysis easier. Um, it is command line driven, um, so you can use it with PS Exec to launch this thing on remote host. It creates CSVs instead of Excel spreadsheets, um, a CSV for each of the different tables that's in the Scrum. So you can then pull back all these CSVs, put them into one big file and analyze it. It does all of the same analysis, all the same lookups and everything else that Strum did. Um, um, and it does it through a plugin that we have. So ESE to CSV is a plugin infrastructure where um, it will, you can, give, you can point it at any ESE database, right? It's not why well, it's not called Strum to CSV. You can point it at any ESE database you have on your systems. So this would include um, well, the Strum, the Edge browser and other things, and it will dump that information. You can also tell, point it at any ESE, ESE to CSV and tell it to build a plugin. And it'll build a generic plugin that basically does nothing but gives you a template so that you can go in and rename fields and add functions that'll process fields and things like that. 
And it comes with two existing plugins. It comes with, with Scrum Dump and it comes with an Edge Browser um, plugin. And each of these plugins, they, well, they dump the fields and they do additional analysis on the, the fields that are in the database. ESC to CSV is also available on my GitHub. So the idea with ESC to CSV um, is you can do from mass collection, as I said, Scrum Dump is intended to be single collection on a single host. Scrum Dump, it gives you a nice graphical user interface. You can point it at a Scrum. Um, you can then tell it what directory you wanna put your output in and give it a template. The template is intended to give the analyst a way of renaming fields, um, or if you don't want it to dump everything, then you put in your template what it is that you want it to dump, and it will only dump those things. If you try and do a dump on your live system, and you're running as administrator, this option comes up and says, hey, uh, auto extract this. Now, I will tell you that you can run Scrum Dump on a machine and analyze your live Scrum and it will, well, the file is pseudo locked, right? Um, by the operating system. I just made up that term pseudo locked. I, um, I say that because, well, it's not locked, but it is in use and being written to. And so Scrum Dump, if you do an analysis on just the live file, then you're going to find that it, just doesn't work, it gives you corrupt um, results. So you're gonna wanna um, run it as an administrator and extract a copy of Scrum Dump when you're doing your analysis, okay? Um, and then it gives you this spreadsheet with the multiple tabs and you get things like, um, hey, Netcat ran on this date and this time by this user and um, it will also, if you passed it the correct registry file, give you the username that was associated with it. Um, they did that over this wireless connection, right? You can then see how much data was transferred over that wireless connection. So you get a lot of information. And this, right, this is, this is like the, let me go back in time over the last 30 days and see every process that's run on my computer. This is very useful stuff in an incident. But ESE to CSV is intended to let you do this at mass, right? It's got a dash L option to let you list the tables that are in there, a dash D option. Um, by default, it's gonna dump every table unless you do dash D and then give it an optional list of tables that I'm only interested in this table or that table. You can give it a plugin. Um, and as I said, it comes with some existing plugins. So this is what it might look like to run this thing at mass across my network. I'll do a PS exec, right? I wanna copy to the remote host, the um, binary. Here's my username, here's my password. This is what I wanna run on the remote system. And this is going to run ES, ESE to CSV. Um, it's going to acquire the files on uh, the locked files on the remote system. It's going to run this plugin. I'm going to write my output to a shared folder that um, is on the network. Um, and this does, it does look to see if the a file already exists with this name and then it will create unique files. So it's not going to, um, it's intended to be run at mass so that you're going to have unique files for each um, system. Um, and then we're going to, uh, and then we're going to tell it to analyze, pass the path to the SRUM to ESE to CSV so it knows what to analyze. And this is going to analyze that stuff. And um, I go to that uh, network file share and there I'll have uh, a CSV from each of the different hosts from the SRUM for the last 30 days across um, the, uh, for as many systems as I run this on. So here's some examples of running it, uh, ESC to CSV, run the SRUM plugin and list the tables here. Because of the plugin, you can see that I get back the table names. If I didn't give it the plug, SRUM plugin, it would still list the table names, but it wouldn't know what they're called, right? It would just give me back GUIDs that are associated with each of the tables that are in there. And it wouldn't have any intelligence that goes on to convert user SIDs into user names or network profiles into um, network names and things like that, okay? Um, you can also, in addition to um, listing files, if you just give it the plugin and a file, it then will auto acquire a copy of that. And then it will begin extracting all of the files, processing all of them. And then if I do a DIR, you can see I have a CSV file for each of the different tables that are associated with that SRUM, okay? Um, uh, I can also dump a specific table. So if I do use the dash E option, I give it the name of a specific table, then, um, then it'll only dump that table. Now, just as a nuance, if you're, the, most Python programs that are out there use a module called argparse. 
Um, so if you can provide multiple arguments, here we have dash D and I could provide it multiple table names. The way that you end your list of arguments to um, an argument to like the dash D which takes multiple arguments is you put a dash dash at the end. So here we, I'm telling you to use the strum dump plugin and dump this table from um, this drum file and it dumps just that CSV, okay? Um, so what about this tools? What if the tool doesn't do exactly what you'd like it to do? Well, I am happy to support these tools, right? So if I'd encourage you to go download a copy of these, all of these are available on my GitHub page, um, uh, github.com slash Mark Baggett. Um, there you'll find Strum Dump and um, ESC to CSV, API FI, um, and Freak and some other tools that you can download and use in your tool. So I'm, I'm happy to support these tools. I plan to keep these running and working. If you have any issues, you can, you're happy to post these. But really, my passion here, right, it's Proverbs 12. If you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. But if you show him to catch a fish, you feed him for a lifetime, right? I, I would love to teach you how to write tools similar to this, to um, adapt these tools, to make things that do exactly what you need um, to do, which is really the, um, the crux behind my class 573, Automating Information Security with Python. So um, if you're interested in learning how to develop your own tools, participating in the open source community, as Greg um, talked about this morning, I'd encourage you to come check out 573. Okay? And that is my talk.